And we're going to uh, take actually one step a bit closer to Estonia. So we're stepping to, to Finland, uh, which is uh, just around the corner here. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very glad that we have actually Maria Beku. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, and uh, she's the CEO at CyberCoach. And, and uh, she's going to talk about the case CyberCoach avoiding harm with AI in security education. So exactly what we just, uh, what we just discussed. But much more in detail. So, Maria, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Beek. And yeah, I will be talking about uh, Case Cyber Coach and how we avoid harm in AI and security education. So, I'm always the one, it seems, at these conferences drawing all the devils on the wall and what could go wrong. And that's kind of what I'm going to do, do here today. I'm following uh, quite impressive names here. So, I thought I'd a little bit introduce myself. There are a lot of people today talking about AI. Who am I to talk about AI? Well, 15 years ago, I was actually. Uh, well, today I'm, my day job is the CEO. I'm um, the CEO at CyberCoach, and as part of that, uh, for the past five years, I've been trying to figure out how we can leverage these new technologies, how we can use technologies like AI um, to learn, uh, teach people, but also um, how how people learn the necessary security privacy skills around that and that algorithmic liter literacy at scale so that they can survive in a society that's based on algorithms. But before that, I spent nearly a decade uh, working with data privacy and cybersecurity across finance, across healthcare, and uh, all together, I guess, 15 years now, uh, working with sensitive personal data. You can see a little kid, poor kid with electrodes on their head. Um, that was me as a researcher in a room 15 years ago trying to build algorithms for analyzing the brain activity of these poor, poor children with screens that look like that. So technology has advanced a lot. Back, uh, back in the days, I was apparently skilled enough to design algorithms for studying very sensitive medical data of small children, but I wasn't receiving any cyber education. So the world has profoundly changed in the last last 15 years. Uh, I managed to uh, graduate as a licentiate in bioinformatics, but now more shifted into cybersecurity, uh, now pursuing my doctoral thesis at the Aalto University in Finland, uh, set to graduate in, in 26. Uh, happy to connect with anyone there, uh, here in the room, so my connection details are there. So when I, when I talk about harm in AI, uh, I want to illustrate what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the timer, by the way, isn't working here, but I'll try to be, be concise. Uh, so one, one case, just one way we are using AI already today in the cybersecurity defense side, so in our corporate security teams. So what are we already doing? That's kind of wrong. <laughs> we are using AI today to target personalized email phishing campaigns at employees and these kinds of continuous phishing uh, email tests to employees and to see if they are susceptible to these attacks. Based on how they perform in these uh, simulations, we actually use AI to personalize and target content to them and remediation to those em employees that actually fail these tests. And finally, we're using AI again <laughs> to risk score all these employees and potentially restrict the use, the access they have on their devices for those employees that we deem high risk. So this is what it looks like. We're using hyper-realistic, and these are marketing, uh, marketing um, uh, little excerpts of marketing of, of different kinds of companies that are already providing these services. So we're using hyper-realistic, scarily personalized attack simulations, where in just a few clicks, you know, you can show that you either know this stuff or you don't know this stuff. And what does that lead us to? The security team will see all these alerts. So. Jack here has compromised his account. <laughs> Some lady ignored the email and somebody opened it. So you get all this kind of metrics in real time of what are these employees doing? We have all the, these data points entering. So we're trying to catch risky employee behaviors right as they happen. So continuous monitoring of employees. And then we have these workflows around that. And we have these intricate dashboards of all these different people. And what is their impact in the organization? What is their risk score? We're traffic lighting them. Who are our red, high risk employees? Who are a little bit less risk in yellow? And who are green? So this is already today. This is what we're doing as security teams under the guise of protecting enterprises uh, from cyber threats. And up to the point of even profile building, so actually studying the vulnerabilities of individuals. So we're going to say that Maria, uh, she's obedient, 15%. <laughs> and she is somebody who watches a lot of sports online, so maybe we're ta targeting her with a Viaplay campaign. She uses the Viaplay app. Uh, it's getting really quite invasive. 
And the reason I worry about this, the reason I go around to these conferences talking about this, is that already nine years ago, our technology was at the point where just 300 data points on an individual could tell us more about that individual than their spouse. My spouse might actually be in this room. <laughs> so I don't know, does this tell us more about you know, marital relations or <laughs> the state of algorithms? But regardless, that's, that's kind of scary. We'd, already nine years ago, we didn't need much data in order to build these comprehensive profiles about individuals. So we're far, far along in that, that today. So what is, that, what is the harm in this exactly, of doing this at scale, this kind of surveillance, monitoring, and risk po profiling, profiling of employees in the workplace at scale? Well, on one hand, uh, the AI profiling and the targeting can be scarily accurate. And we're needing less and less data points to do that. So that's, that's scary because if we can use it for good, attackers can use it for bad. <laughs> so we're effectively putting targets on employees' backs. Uh, in the, under the guise of protecting the enterprise. But then it can also be scarily inaccurate. So it can lead to unjust treatment of individuals. It can lead to very biased decision making. It wasn't long ago that I was actually at a security conference where they were trying to say that young women are the most likely clickers. And that has nothing to do. That's not grounded in any sort of scientific reality. Uh, just to remind you guys of where we are today with, uh, with the technology, I've just spent several weeks really studying the EU AI Act. And I asked a few test questions from ChatGPT, like how are we doing? What, what, how does ChatGPT understand the AI Act? And it hallucinated the fines. It couldn't even get the fine percentages right. <laughs> so we're using technology that is at this level to target hyper-personalized attacks at employees to risk profile employees in the workplace and in ways that will affect their employment. So that's, that's kind of a scary reality. And if we think of that's the situation today, um, what are we exposing the kids of today in the future? I mean, this is just the development we've seen the last 10, 15 years. What, what does the next 10, 15 years look like? If we're gathering this data set now today, how can that be used and abused 15 years down the road? I don't know, can it be avoided? Um, that's kind of what I hope to, hope to talk to you guys today. I think so, yes. I wouldn't be in cybersecurity if I wasn't inherently optimistic that there was a world to be saved, <laughs> that there was a, something to save, uh, something to gain here. And I think it can be saved through regulation, obviously, the AI Act being one, one great step towards that, prohibiting some, some use cases. It can be saved through education. The more people know, the more they can control, uh, the more they can actually affect um, their, their privacy and their rights. And through different kinds of anonymous solutions and data minimization. So taking kind of a step back and thinking, do we need all this data? What is the actual goal we need to accomplish? Do we need to monitor employees this invasively? Is there an alternative? And I, I really want to believe that we do have an alternative. That's what my day job is all about. So for the past soon six years, we've been building CyberCoach. CyberCoach is the first anonymous and psychologically safe uh, security awareness training platform. So we do none of that invasive AI targeting, monitoring, or profiling of employees. We actually enable them to learn in a, psychologi a psychologically safe, anonymous environment. What it looks like, um, you can choose tone, so you can kind of have these personalizations, but have them anonymously. Uh, have these kind of fun, engaging, old school, text-based games where you start a training, you make decisions, and then things unfold. So the scenario unfolds, and then you learn in kind of a very safe environment, all kinds of attack scenarios and everything that can, can happen in, in real life. And then you collect, collect badges for that. Uh, we offer these role-based, so we have highly technical content as well, uh, content for leadership, uh, content for factory floor, you name it, we got it. So we believe that there's a whole world out there of security skills that people need. It's not just about not clicking a link or having a good password anymore, that's not enough. We need to go far beyond that in the security education space and the corporate education space. And that's something that we're trying to, trying to do with CyberCoach. And I think my key takeaway today for the audience here and everybody making decisions around how we use AI in education is that let's try to remember that not everything is an AI. <laughs> we have this great opportunity. There are lots of great things we can do around AI, but there are some things that we don't need to do, <laughs> use AI for. And I, I'm a big believer in this kind of simple, simple uh, motto that, you know, we can use the dumbest possible solution <laughs> for the problem that we're trying to solve, because uh, then we can at least understand it and maybe minimize some of the harm, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. It doesn't need to be super complicated. But thank you, everyone. Looking forward to continuing the discussion. Please get in touch. <laughs>
awesome. And I really, really do love when somebody comes on a stage with such kind of energy and being very optimistic. And we actually already received one question also about like being optimistic about the entire security. And once again, you can ask your questions and please be active because, you know, you, you will get your answers here on the stage. Uh, so you said that you're very op optimistic about, again, the AI use in cybersecurity and so on. Is there anything, if you could admit that side, that you're also very afraid of in the field of cybersecurity? A lot. <laughs> and what are you afraid of? Uh, I think it's mostly this kind of, uh, the more power we're giving to AI in terms of scoring, assessing, profiling, the more automation we're trying to do with that. Because what I'm seeing is that, like, although we've kind of made technological Im improvements and efficiency improvements with AI, we haven't really made any major improvements in terms of the hallucinations and the accuracy of the technology. And as, like, looking back at my engineering and mathematics background and the research that we're currently seeing in this space, I don't know if we're going to see that in the coming years. Mm -hmm. But we are more and more widely <laughs> using AI at the same time. So that's, that's something that I'm very concerned about, that do the people that use AI have the necessary skills Mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate what the AI is in inputting. And especially when we're thinking of learning, I think that's really important because when you're learning something, by definition, you're not the expert <laughs> in what you're learning. So, so learning from AI, you need to kind of a bit be. So, so finding those use cases, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so I always love to ask a question when be, uh, people talk about like also AI and cybersecurity. If I would put the scale here, and this is opportunities, and here is uh, the side of threats, where would you put AI? Threats and opportunities. <laughs> right now, to be honest, I'm seeing a lot more threats yeah. than opportunities. And how uh, we can move to the direction yeah, exactly. of exactly. I, I think there are clear ways we can move towards the opportunity side. Uh, we just need to expand the conversation around, uh, around the potential harm. And that's, that's really going to be. And do you think also that in terms of all the regulations and everything, because like in terms of like the EU and its regulations, and you brought it up also the EU AI Act as well, and East 2 uh, as, as well, that is regulating a lot of things also for this, especially for the cybersecurity sense of view as well. Um, do you think that these things are again necessary in terms of like, you know, finding that good kind of a bliss point there as well. Absolutely. And with education, everybody knows that we're really short on resources everywhere. So it's really easy to build this business case and this opportunity around using AI. The challenge is that are we going to come up with these rules mm -hmm. <laughs> and to make it safe enough, fast enough, because we're going to need it. We have the skill gap we're talking about today. And, and it's there's no question that we're going to need this technology to solve these problems. It's just that we really need to spend time figuring this out and thinking this through. All right. We'll continue the discussion with you uh, later and yep. also in a panel. But uh, once again, a very big thank you to Maria.